All right, folks, and welcome back. This is a lecture on Chapter 14, uh, which is really one of my favorite topics. It's a presentations, how to make a good PowerPoint. Uh, in this chapter, again, we'll be focusing on planning for the presentation. In other words, creating our slides and, and thinking about the content we want in there, uh, analyzing the audience and so on and so forth. Uh, next time, we'll talk about how to deliver it, how to get over anxiety and all of that good stuff. So if that's what's uh, a major concern, <laughs> I just wait. We'll cover that all next time. Uh, and once again, to set the stage here, I've got a, actually a couple of videos. Uh, one is Don McMillan uh, giving a pretty famous uh comedy sketch uh, called Death by PowerPoint. Uh, so go watch that. I want everybody to watch that one. Uh, as you're watching it, you know, of course, laugh. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. But uh, be thinking about, okay, yes, it's a, uh, yes, it's humor. It's satire. But, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe you've done some of that stuff or you've uh, seen other people do it. And uh, be thinking about the impact that sort of thing has on uh, the credibility of a presenter. And then another video I uploaded just for fun. I'm, I don't want, uh, you to think it's required because there's a bit of salty language in there. Uh, but it's a Saturday Night Live skit uh, about PowerPoint and some <laughs> a Microsoft team comes in to try to teach people how to use PowerPoint better. So uh, I think it's hilarious, but again, I don't want you to feel like you have to watch it if you were uh, offended by uh, that kind of language. So optional, uh, but if you do watch it, I, again, I would like to know your thoughts on, you know, what can you learn from that? What can, what can you glean from it that might be useful for uh, a professional communicator. Uh, so anyway, uh, pause, go watch uh, the first video. Uh, you can watch SNL if you want, up to you. Uh, come back, reflect on it a little bit, and then we'll get into our uh, topic. All right, so here we go with our learning objectives. You can see we have six today. We're talking about how planning the presentation leads to credibility. We'll be talking about how to analyze the audience in terms of message benefits, learning styles, <laughs> I will have more to say about this one, as well as communicator styles. Talk about how to organize and gather the content uh, for three different aspects, previewing, viewing, and reviewing. And uh, we'll talk about developing the slide itself or the presentation as a whole. Uh, we'll talk about the storyline approach to presentations. Uh, what is that? How do you use it? Why should you use it? And then we'll talk about evaluating your presentations for fairness as well as effectiveness. So it's not enough just to have an effective PowerPoint or an effective presentation. We also want to make sure we're being ethical, uh, we're being fair. And here's the layout of the chapter. So you can see again, as always, it more or less matches the, uh, uh, the order of those learning objectives. All right, so how does planning a presentation lead to credibility? Uh, so there's an example here, and there's several of these. Uh, so, uh, you know, the big part of the advice in the in the videos, as well as the slides, don't put everything you're going to read on the slide. Nevertheless, <laughs> that's what we have here. Uh, so I will be reading some of this, uh, but as I'm doing that, maybe you could get a little bit meta with it and think, uh, you know, don't let yourself be bored by it. Instead, be thinking, well, what kind of effect is this having on me right now? Uh, listening to this text uh, being read, you know, really try to, uh, to amps, do a little self-analysis and figure out why this isn't always uh, the best approach. Uh, but anyway, here's the scenario they've painted here for us. So we got a presentation and we got a manager saying, quote, the project costs more than expected because the engineering department gave an incorrect initial estimate and because the workers didn't work hard enough and fell behind schedule. Uh, so they're saying here, if, if you're part of that audience and you realize that the real cause of this uh, overage was due to a permit delay <laughs> as a, and a material rise in material costs, uh, and the manager is just wrong, uh, you think, well, obviously this manager is, is incompetent. Uh, he or she doesn't know what they're doing, basically. And that would probably damage their credibility uh, quite a bit there. Uh, we have another example. Uh, that first one was uh, an example of uh, how it can affect competence. Remember, there's the three C's of uh, credibility. And so that was competence. Uh, here you have a situation with a manager saying to employees, quote, the only way we can finish the project on time is if we all work overtime for the next two weeks. If you have other obligations during this time, cancel them. I need everyone here, no exceptions. So they're saying there, you're, you see, she's unwilling to even consider the needs of those employees. I mean, we are humans. <laughs> we have, many of us have families. We have responsibilities. And uh, any kind of zero tolerance policy like this just doesn't, 
it just really seems in inhuman, doesn't it? Seems like some kind of a, a dictator would say something like this. <laughs> Definitely doesn't come across as somebody that cares about you. And so again, if you feel like this manager is uncaring, uh, that would affect uh, your view of her credibility. So hopefully these are making sense. You can see uh, the whole goal of this thing, people always get too fixated on the uh, uh, the speaker role. Uh, but again, put yourself in that audience, the uh, sh audience's shoes, and that will give you a tool already to evaluate a presentation. Uh, it's relatively easy to do, but we'll get more into it. Okay, we talked about confidence. We talked about uh, uh, caring. Uh, here we get to character. And so the situation, while making a presentation to potential investors, an, ex an executive says, quote, I guarantee that your investments will double in value <laughs> over the next three years. <laughs> Wouldn't this be wonderful? That uh, sounds like some kind of uh, pyramid scheme, right? Uh, so if the executive's claim fails to come true, his character and thus his credibility will be harmed. So you think this person is a either a liar, a cheat, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, so there you go, three different ways uh, these presentations can affect your uh, credibility. Now we want to get into the aim, process, audience, information, and message. Uh, so first up, analyzing the audience to make sure you're addressing their needs and speaking to them in a way that is most appealing and easy to learn. Uh, that's the audience point. And then we have the information of uh, aim. Uh, this is uh, developing information and ideas by identifying the key facts and conclusions related to the topic. So this is uh, <laughs> the key. <laughs> uh, the key is the key. And so instead of trying to think, talk about every possible aspect of a topic, uh, talk people to death, or have a disorganized uh, PowerPoint or presentation, we're kind of all over the place. Uh, instead, you want to leave some stuff out, basically. Uh, you don't want to be necessarily comprehensive. Instead, you want to think about some key things, some key points you can get across, uh, some, some takeaways. Uh, that's going to matter more uh, in many cases than trying to put every possible detail into a presentation. And we talked about that too with graphs last time and a couple, I don't know, maybe it was a couple uh, lectures ago. But we talked about even, sometimes a table. Uh, if you put too much stuff onto the table or too much stuff into the pie chart, uh, it actually is, uh, it doesn't help communicate. It actually harms communication because it's uh, there's too much there. Uh, there's no way for somebody to look at that and come away with a key point of that. <laughs> you know, wh why is this chart here? Uh, sometimes that gets lost in just the sheer amount of detail. Uh, so that brings us to this uh, last point here, developing the message to focus on the key takeaway concept and provide supporting points throughout. Uh, so really this, I think, uh, you know, a whole lot of this uh, chapter could be boiled down into this aspect here. So no matter how much information you want to get across, uh, you have to think instead about, well, here's the time I have, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Here's the audience. <laughs> here's the tools at my disposal. I'm not going to be able to talk about everything, every aspect. Uh, so what's really important? Uh, what's going to be the most valuable things for that audience? And that's what I'll focus on. And I know some of you work in the uh, the right place or you uh, are teaching writing. And this is a good piece of advice, too, when it comes to, uh, I'm sure you've been taught this <laughs> She's a consultant uh, or as an instructor. But uh, yeah, let's say you look at a student's paper and there's many, many problems with it. You know, there, there could be, uh, you know, a smorgasbord of, of errors. Uh, but if you try to sit, sit down with this, this uh, student and uh, start talking about, you know, 30 different problems, uh, you're not going to go anywhere. It's just really just not, you're going to just overwhelm the person. It's not going to be effective. Uh, instead, you might just think about the most pressing issues or, or, or issues that can be uh, easily uh, explained and or the easiest ones to explain so the student can get a better result in, in the short term uh, rather than trying to cover every possible uh, aspect. So that's, a lot of this applies not just to uh, business presentations, but really even a, even a writing tutorial can benefit from these ideas. All right, analyzing the audience and gathering the right information. Uh, so this is a good question. I like this first one. How will the audience members benefit from the product, service, or ideas you are proposing? So this one, again, you know, teachers uh, just tend to think that they shouldn't have to explain the value <laughs> or you should just be taking the class because, you know, they're the kind of uh, 
Uh, maybe they have an attitude about it, but may, probably more likely they just don't really consider this, the importance of this. Uh, but you know as a student, if you can see how a lecture benefits you in some way, it's going to be a step towards your career, or it's useful information somehow, somehow it's applicable, that's going to make you a lot better uh, student, right? You'll be able to pay attention more, you'll be more engaged, uh, you know, everything across the, the board. So you notice, uh, I always start off my presentations with this idea, right? Why is this, is this an important topic? Uh, yes, it is. How will you uh, use uh, presentations? Uh, well, probably as a professional communicator, or as a teacher, or even a writing teacher, uh, writing consultant, whatever it is, you'll be using a lot of these same uh, you know, ideas. So that's just an example uh, from the lecture itself, I suppose. And I think that's important. Instead of just jumping in, assuming that you agree with me, uh, taking a little time to unpack the benefits and uh, thinking about, well, wouldn't you, uh, if you do a really good job preparing your uh, for your presentation, you have good slide design, uh, you're well organized, you're on point. Uh, there's many benefits to that. Not just making a more effective PowerPoint, but even you'll feel more relaxed. A lot of the issues we'll get into next time will be lessened. Uh, if you do proper preparation, you won't be as anxious. <laughs> you won't have as much need to be, uh, you know, thinking about meditation and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's just the first bit. Uh, I guess the long story short, whatever the presentation is, make sure that it's clear uh, to the audience why they're there, uh, what, you, what they can expect to get out of this uh, presentation. Uh, and I see conference presentations all the time. You go to any academic conference, nine times out of ten, you got somebody up there. Uh, they don't bother with this. They just start reading their paper. It takes you about five, ten minutes to figure out even what the paper's about, uh, much less uh, what you can get out of it. A bad, bad uh, communication there. All right, moving on. What do the audience, audience members already know about your product, uh, service, or idea? So this is, uh, again, critical because if they already know what you're telling them, guess what? <laughs> They're going to get bored out of their minds. So it's incredibly boring. Uh, you know, they already know this stuff. Now, I will say as a teacher, though, as somebody who's interested in always becoming a better teacher, uh, one of the things I like to do is watch uh, uh, lectures on content before I uh, teach about it. Uh, even though I know the stuff, you know, I probably know everything there is to know about uh Oh, this topic, for example. <laughs> but yet seeing other teachers teach about it, uh, it's kind of inspiring in a way. And plus, I can see how they're teaching it. And that becomes kind of a lesson uh, more so than what, what it is they're actually, uh, you know, the content becomes less important than their delivery. So I'm, I'm learning uh, from like the way they organize their presentation and their, uh, the tone of their voice, even the kinds of examples they're using. Uh, so I just say all this to kind of program you, hopefully, to think, you know, my, if you are in a lecture, you're at a business meeting or whatever it is, <laughs> you already know everything there is to know about product, service, or, or ideas. Uh, maybe you can use that approach I'm telling you about where you start to kind of study the uh, delivery. And that way you can still get some, some benefit out of it, uh, even if, uh, you know, the information is not new. And you think, well, why is he telling me this? <laughs> well, trust me, you'll be, as a professional communicator, you will no doubt sit through many such presentations. So... It's good to get some value out of it. Uh, thirdly, uh, what are your audience's members' uh, chief concerns? And a lot of times these can be very different uh, than what you assume they are. You know, you talk to colleagues all the time and, you know, they'll, they'll be expecting the, <laughs> you know, say, well, does anybody have any questions about the assignment? They're kind of anticipating uh, these deep, meaningful, probing questions about the reading, uh, the issues, you know, something... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, something densely theoretical. Uh, and usually their students are just wondering, like, well, when is the thing due? And uh, how long does it, does it have to be? <laughs> how, many, how many sources are, are you talking about? Uh, so you might have a real disconnect there uh, because there's, there wasn't really a, an effort to understand what these uh, audience members are chiefly concerned about. Maybe you think, well, you shouldn't be concerned about that. That shouldn't be your chief concern. Uh, but that's another issue, right? Uh, the point is, <laughs> really the question is, do you even know what they are? So you're analyzing the audience and gathering the right information, two of two. Uh, so who are the key decision makers? This is an interesting question. And in sales, uh, they talk about the, uh, I think it seems seem like they always use this car lot example. 
uh, but you have the used car salesperson, or I guess the new car salesperson. But anyway, so the couple comes up, uh, you know, husband and wife, let's say, and uh, the salesperson is really studying these two, the way they talk, the way they're looking at each other, the body language, uh, to try to figure out who's which one is actually making the decision here. It's not necessarily the person who's uh, doing the talking or doing most of the talking, asking most of the questions, right? Uh, sometimes it's somebody who doesn't say anything, very quiet. <laughs> Uh, maybe they don't really even seem to be paying attention, uh, but that might turn out to be the key decision maker. And if the salesperson isn't savvy on that, uh, well, they wouldn't be very, uh, <laughs> wouldn't be making any many sales, right? <laughs> uh, but you could think too, uh, you know, you see a lot of presentations or well, let's say it's a job interview and my brother just went through a, a job interview. He was really shocked uh, that, you know, he's going out to be a middle school teacher. And he was telling me, uh, he says, you know, Matt, I was really, I wasn't prepared for this interview. And I said, well, what, you know, what was the problem? And he said, there wasn't just one person. You know, I was expecting, uh, you know, to sit down at a desk and be somebody across from the desk and, you know, and just be kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing. Instead, there was like a panel there of <laughs> four different teachers. <laughs> and it was really, uh, he really was uncomfortable. Kind of just got caught. He wasn't, you know, he should have been prepared for that. I think that's fairly typical. Uh, but I think this this kind of question came up like, well, OK, if there's four people there, uh, maybe one of them ha holds a lot of sway. And these other ones might be just there just to kind of give more advice uh, or to make it a little bit more of a fair process. You know, who knows what it is. Uh, but it would have been good if he could have figured out, like, who is the key decision maker? Who has maybe the, there was a person there that was, was really was up to them uh, to make the decision. And these other people were there to you know, provide feedback. Uh, we don't know. I uh, see so this is a question, right? If you could figure this out, <laughs> all the better. Uh, what you don't really want to be in is a situation where you just have no idea uh, who's really important. Uh, maybe somebody's there that's not even a, a part of the decision making process. Could be just a random audience member. Uh, let's see what will appeal to your audience. And again, you have to know uh, a bit about the audience. I know a lot of uh, a lot of the students in this class tell me they teach uh, different levels. I think I've got some. Uh, pretty sure I have a preschool teacher in here. It seems like maybe a secondary. Maybe seem like all levels, and of course, lots of people that want to teach college. Uh, some people that don't care about college but might have might have kids at home. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of uh, differences when you're uh, talking to small children. Uh, they, they're not going to find the same examples appealing, <laughs> the same slides, <laughs> and we're not even getting into like intercultural uh, issues. Uh, if, you know, if you were giving a presentation in Japan, for example, uh, you'd probably want to change a lot of stuff up. Even like colors uh, can make a big difference. So, uh, again, the more you can know about this audience, what do they like? Uh, you know, I recently had a. I've been in a couple situations now where there's there, these textbook reps textbook representatives and uh, they're trying to get me to pick out a book use one of their textbooks for my my classes right and uh, the ones I can always tell the ones that have been doing it for a while and because they really have their sort of routine down and they know how to uh, sort of size me up they ask me certain questions and then they'll show me uh, the textbooks and you know either they'll show me ones that I do find appealing you know that usually it's things like I <laughs> I like a textbook without a lot of nonsense and uh, something uh, you know that's got a lot of good detail, real science, evidence-based uh, material. I'm not really impressed with uh, uh, lots of uh, licensed uh, photos and things. <laughs> you know, like a robust uh, 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 electronic supplement, web-based supplements like these uh, PowerPoints. You know, that's the sort of stuff I, I like. Uh, but every now and then I'll find one that I really think kind of misreads me completely. <laughs> you know, they're trying to warm up to me by asking me questions about uh, uh, sports, you know, all these questions, you know, what do I think about the, the Vikings and, and such and such a ch ch coach? <laughs> I just have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't really follow sports. Uh, so they kind of, uh, you know, missed the boat on that one. Well, let's see, uh, third one. What is the learning style of your audience? And this is, uh, you know, this is the one I kind of, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that one. I think there's some more slides on it, but basically I'll just say no, the, the science isn't really there on that. 
this idea of the uh, you're a visual learner, you're a hands-on learner, experiential learners, and, and whatever. You know, the, that's been uh, the, the more recent learning uh, learning theory, <laughs> learning research has shown that that's basically bunk. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not really effective. It might be useful as a way to generate ideas. And I think it's always good to be thinking about uh, multiple ways to get a point across, uh, sure. Uh, but just those uh, personality profiles, they find that they're, they're really not all that useful. <laughs> uh, or at least there's not a whole, there's not strong evidence to, to uh, support those. And I know that's a really popular thing. It's uh, easy to glom on to, but uh, uh, nevertheless, maybe that, that should be updated a little bit. Uh, okay, who are the key decision makers? You know, who can you figure out who it is making those uh, decisions? See, so they actually give us advice here. <laughs> Focus most of your attention on them. Okay, but how do we know? Uh, think about which individuals are the decision makers or who you perceive is the most likely prospects uh, for future business. So I don't, uh, <laughs> really the most effective uh, information, but, uh, you know, if you do well research sales and marketing books, uh, you know, those are a dime a dozen. Just go to Kinko's or next time you're in a, any kind of office store, there's going to be a little bookshelf somewhere and you can find some books on this. A lot of uh, interest in, say, body language, and you can watch TED Talks on it. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's body language that can tell you this stuff. Uh, there's also, uh, of course, you could do the uh, figure out what the job titles of the people are. Uh, if people go around and introduce themselves, you could figure out who's the uh, the CEO or who's the uh, the dean. Uh, for example, one of the coming back to these textbook reps, uh, they usually don't spend a lot of time uh, talking to people that they know uh, the textbooks are assigned to them. And so I had a you know at USF the uh, comp director just picked the textbook and everybody used. Uh, the individuals, uh, you know, TAs didn't get a say in it. And so obviously the book reps <laughs> couldn't care less, <laughs> you know, what any of us thought about the textbooks. They just, uh, you know, would whine and dine the uh, comp director. Uh, but one time he uh, came up with the idea that he would let us vote on the textbook. Uh, so we had each rep come and give a presentation and, um, and then we would all vote uh, to decide which uh, you know, textbook we like the best, and <laughs> you know, that really changed the uh, dynamic. But suddenly, you know, they knew full well uh, that that comp director still probably had the most sway. Uh, so I watched very carefully these uh, when they came in to give their, their talks, and I could tell they were still really most concerned about the comp director. But you know, they wanted to make sure they got across too that they were listening to us. We had plenty of chances to, to ask questions and whatnot. And so there, there's you a little bit better, <laughs> a little bit clearer of an example of uh, what it is we're talking about here. Uh, okay, what will appeal uh, to your audience? Uh, so that obviously if it's an oral communication, there's a reason they're having this thing in a person, right? There's a reason that somebody, uh, you know, prefers to go to a stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> uh, there's something about that immediacy. There's something about that presence there. Makes it more intense a lot of ways, All right? Stronger uh, emotional appeal. You know, everything from the tone of your voice, uh, you know, the, the body language, everything else. Uh, your speeches and presentations will also include a set of ideas you want your audience to appreciate analytically. Yeah, so part of it is they just like seeing a person there, uh, you know, go, going over the material. You know, I was just at a uh, one of these uh, presentations here at St. Cloud State, and they were saying that a lot of students these days, they don't, the content is already out there, right, for the college. Uh, you don't need to pay all this money and sign up for this class to learn the material <laughs> that's, that's on these slides, right? I mean, you could uh, go to any Kinko's, uh, any Office Depot, whatever, uh, find a book on this. You probably just find it free online. Uh, so the content is there, but what you're paying for is just the oral communication aspect, right? Uh, that human presence, that emotional appeal. <laughs> it's, it's kind of strange to talk about my own uh, emotional appeal. Uh, but there's something about, not just me, obviously, but you know, having a human involved uh, that makes it more appealing uh, than if I just said, go read this. Uh, just go, here's the PowerPoint, download it, flip through the slides yourself. Uh, you know, that wouldn't have that, that emotional uh, appeal.
All right, so here's just the jazz about the visual learners. So as I said, I'm very skeptical of this. I'm a little uh, uh, surprised to see it in here. But I'm pretty sure this. <laughs> just do a quick Google search for like <laughs> learning style bogus uh, or learning styles debunked, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, but anyway, it's kind of an interesting theory. Uh, so there, I think instead of thinking about this neuro, new, like a neurologically thing. Uh, you know, like a brain, something in your brain makes you more disposed to visual learning. Uh, I think it makes more sense to think about just your, your preference uh, as well as, uh, you know, what you personally find appealing. Uh, that makes a little more sense to me. Uh, but even there, they've, they, <laughs> y'all won't go into the research. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, the so-called visual learners, they claim or they, they prefer illustrations and simple diagrams. And they're saying, I think, I think that's about 40%. Uh, auditory learners, you know, obviously this would be a, a voice, a sound. Uh, best, believe emotion is best conveyed through voice. Okay, so maybe this person is a little savvier than I thought, because notice how they say believe, because uh, that's what this research has shown, is that this, you can believe very strongly uh, that you're an auditory learner. And you can fill out, you know, survey after survey where you say, yes, this is how I learn best. You might believe that, but then they find uh, that it doesn't really matter. Uh, everybody learns more or less uh, the same way, uh, despite uh, these uh, beliefs. Uh, let's see, kinesthetic learners need to participate to focus their attention on your message and learn best. So in other words, the, uh, the hands-on approach. So, so again, uh, you know, I don't know if it's been totally debunked. I have it. I'm just going by what I heard from, in that uh, learning... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that learning uh, course I took from the Great Courses uh, Plus, they, you know, that professor gives some pretty good arguments as to why that uh, we shouldn't get too fixated on this idea anymore. Uh, but your mileage may vary. And again, I think it's, if, if for not, no other reason, it's useful as a brainstorming tool, uh, a way to think about different ways to get your uh, message across. And plus it is, you know, if somebody really has a, you know, if you're trying to uh, deliver a message to somebody who says, look, I prefer visuals, I, I'm a visual learner. And then if you tell them, oh, actually, there's no scientific reason behind that. <laughs> so here's a big book for you to read. Well, that's just going to uh, make them unhappy and they're probably not going to uh, accept your message, right? So uh, there is that. There's that sort of rhetorical aspect to this that goes beyond uh, the science. All right, developing your message. Identifying a few takeaway messages and you notice this, I said this was also important for your uh, presentations that I want you to do uh, for this class. Uh, again, there, there's a billion things you could say about any topic. Uh, but think instead about maybe one, two, maybe as many as three, <laughs> like takeaways. I think three is a pretty good number to shoot for. Like what are some things I can take home, take away from this meeting and, and actually use? Uh, some things I can do. Uh, so you could imagine like this uh, learning theory course I was talking about, a lot of it was very theoretical. Uh, they talked all about stuff, neurological stuff, uh, brain chemicals. I mean, I don't claim to be a, <laughs> you know, I didn't understand all of that, uh, but they would distill it onto a few takeaway messages. Like uh, one of the lectures, uh, one of the takeaway messages was uh, don't use a highlighter. You know, everybody thinks that they need to highlight their book, uh, all kinds of different colors. Uh, but again, the science shows that that actually is detrimental. You learn, you retain less uh, if you're uh, highlighting everything. And so that was just one of those takeaway messages. And the reason I can remember that is that it was presented in exactly that format I was telling you, you know, 30 minutes of content, but then at the end, or at the beginning and at the end, they came back to these, uh, you know, here's a few takeaways. And like, here's some things you can do with this information. Uh, don't use a highlighter. Okay, I think I can remember that. <laughs> Matt, don't use a highlighter. Uh, it kind of stuck with me. Uh, structuring your presentation with a clear preview, view, and review. So that's one of the things that this, these slides do well, I think. Uh, you know, we, we always have the learning objectives, the chapter overview up front, give you a, you know, sort of, this is what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> we had the message, and then we come back at the end with some uh, recap. Okay, a few, how do I identify a few takeaway messages? So two or three key, key messages, everything in the presentation should lead back to them. 
Now summarize your key takeaway messages at the outset and then re-emphasize them uh, several times. So you could think about the, the takeaway message or you could think about a theme, like this is the theme of my presentation. Everything's going to be oriented around uh, these key points. So that's why you should select these things as part of your planning, right? So you can keep coming back to them. Instead of having uh, 15 points, <laughs> you know, think about instead of 15 points, uh, maybe have uh, three, uh, three to five points and have multiple presentations. Now that'd be a lot, that would work a lot better. All right, typically the preview, uh, so this is the, I guess, the first part of the presentation. So they say, let's see, about 10 to 15% of your presentation time. So what is it you want to talk about? Uh, it's very important, again, not to just jump in uh, into the middle somewhere, but you really want to give people a clear heads up about how this thing is laid out, the topic, the scope. Uh, so your view, in other words, the bulk of the content is 85 to 90%. And then uh, the review takes up the least time, five uh, percent. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. This might surprise you here, though. Uh, I think you probably thought like I did. <laughs> you know, you, you take ten to fifteen minutes of uh, preview. You probably think it'd be ten to fifteen minutes of review. Uh, but they're actually not saying that. They're saying you want this ending to be really short and sweet. The shortest part is that review phase. I guess we're kind of going back over uh, the main points. And then, you know, again, it does make sense. If you, done a, if you made an effective uh, presentation, you really shouldn't have to spend that much time reviewing. Uh, it should have been clear, <laughs> clear enough the first time. Or it shouldn't be so long uh, that people have forgotten those points. Right, so again, a lot of this has to do with uh, managing the time well and not trying to cram too much stuff into a single presentation. All right, the uh, compelling preview. You know, how do you start off your presentation? That's some great examples we'll get into. We've got attention getters, we've got positioning statements, we've got overview statements, uh, but they add here that audience members have their answers to the following questions. So during that first few minutes, audience members have their answers to the following questions. Uh, so think about when you opened up this video, started watching my presentation. Some part of you, these are the questions that probably ran through your mind. Now you probably didn't think about them in these words, you might not have been conscious of it, uh, but you might have asked yourself these. And the first one is, am I going to listen? So you see the topic, you hear the first little bit, you think, am I going to listen to this? Or am I going to just go ahead and leave it running in the background as I uh, play with uh, uh, Facebook or read the news or, or whatever? Uh, the second one, am I going to benefit from what is said? Uh, so you might have thought, uh, well, uh, yeah, but this probably does benefit me, so maybe I should listen. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe uh, you thought, oh, I already know all that. Uh, third, will it be valuable enough to take with me? So even if it's interesting, just on, on itself, you know, on the surface, you might still be thinking, well, it might be interesting. Yeah, but is this something applicable? Is this something I'm going to apply? Uh, if it is, you'll probably listen more. And then am I going to act on what I hear? Uh, so really, if you think about these questions, aren't they all about relevance? You know, all these questions are really about it. How is this relevant to me? Is this relevant to me somehow? And if you say no, uh, then it gets, <laughs> it gets to be a monumental, not just uh, for the speaker, uh, but really as an audience member, your job gets a lot harder to listen. So I always tell students, uh, you know, obviously, you know, teachers try their best. Not all teachers are the same, uh, but no matter how quote unquote bad uh, a teacher is, uh, a lot, you can do a lot better in that class if you try to focus on, uh, you know, focus your mental, mentally yourself on finding ways to make it relevant. <laughs> so even if it seems totally irrelevant, if you, even if you just have to kind of hypnotize yourself, this is relevant, uh, this is interesting, uh, this, <laughs> this will come in really handy <laughs> at some point. I just know it. Uh, you know, I'm being a little bit silly here, but uh, honest to goodness, uh, if you can, uh, convince yourself that you it is relevant, it is worth, it is beneficial. Uh, you should pay attention to it. Believe it or not, just having that belief uh, will make it easier to learn in that class. You'll get more out of it. So there's <laughs> a lesson to you. And uh, yes, that is part of that learning uh, course I was telling you about. All right, anyway, let's get into this uh, 
uh, topic of effective attention getters. Uh, so you're up there, people would probably much rather talk amongst themselves <laughs> than have to listen to you. <laughs> At least that's been uh, my experience. Uh, so what can you do to get their attention? And the first example, or the first uh, type is the rhetorical question. So th this just means the question, you're not really expecting them to answer this out loud. Uh, it's just there to kind of get them thinking, uh, maybe suggest uh, the relevance. Uh, so let's just read this one. Have any of you ever thought about your performance review? Uh, let me see. Have any of you ever thought your performance review wasn't fair? Or have you ever dreaded delivering a performance review? As we started looking at research about annual reviews, we found that most employees and managers don't think annual reviews improve performance. Uh, so that's it. I think this is a really good one here. You know, that if I say this is a, if you heard this talk was about performance reviews, it probably wouldn't be the most riveting subject matter. Uh, but when they present it in this way, it does, you know, you could see how that uh, could start getting you kind of nodding and, uh, and you know, kind of <laughs> gets a little easier to pay attention. Uh, focuses on an unmet need, gets them thinking about personal experiences, because that's really what they're worried about, right? Is, you know, what does this have to do with me? Or what can I do uh, with this information? So it ticks that box. Uh, roughly 20 seconds to deliver that. I don't know if you were timing me. <laughs> okay. Uh, here we have the uh, vivid example type of uh, effective attention getter number two. So let's look at this one. Now we held two focus groups with employees about their views of annual annual reviews. Right at the start of the first focus group, one of the employees, whom everyone recognizes as devoted, reliable, and friendly, simply said, quote, the reviews don't help us at all, unquote. Every person in the group nodded their heads. <laughs> Nearly every comment I hear from employees came back to this simple theme. Annual reviews don't help the employees perform better, be more voted, motivated, or be more invested in their work. Uh, so this one I think is, I don't know if I'd say this is more effective, but uh, I really like the picture this paints You know, at the beginning. I can almost see this, this audience <laughs> nodding their heads. <laughs> it gives me a little visual there. Uh, so that's a really good one too. A little bit longer to get that story told, but uh, uh, it works. Uh, now we have the dramatic demonstration. I, I <laughs> software, yeah. <laughs> My first thought was Steve Jobs. Uh, you know, if you haven't ever seen uh, Steve Jobs give a presentation, just go on YouTube and look for like uh, uh, Steve Jobs uh, announcing iPad or something. Yeah, and watch how he does his his thing. He's he's the sort of king of this dramatic demonstration. Uh, here's the one from there uh, from the book. Live demo, of, so this, somebody's up there showing off the software, and this is the uh, what they say. Uh, some of you are probably wondering what makes continuous reviews possible. We can do it with a variety of software platforms. If you look at the screen, I'm going to take two to three minutes to demo how the platform works. You'll see how employees get immediate, helpful, and accurate feedback. Now, I want you to think a little bit about where else you might have seen <laughs> a dramatic demonstration, and I'll, uh, I'm wondering if you're thinking about the same place I am, but I tend to see these whenever I go to the state fair. Uh, if you go where the vendors are, uh, there will be somebody there with some kitchen knives or a little chopper, <laughs> a little chopper tool, <laughs> uh, or the, you know, some kind of cooking thing, uh, but they'll be there showing you some cookware, like pots and pans or whatever, uh, Massage uh, tables, or uh, what is this? Those, those sort of water, <laughs> water massage things. <laughs> I don't even know what. I've always been too scared to try that. Uh, but anyway, you have this this demo, and, and a lot of people that maybe aren't even interested in that chopper or, or massager, uh, just the the, the uh, drama around that demonstration lures them in, and so these folks can really get a you know, a big crowd uh, gathered around. <laughs> Let's talk about what's probably pretty boring, <laughs> but they found a way to make it uh, uh, really get people's attention with this uh, demonstration. Uh, so yeah, so it gives the audience a tangible sense of how the platform can produce 
continuous helpful feedback. All right, types of effective attention getters for a seven. So there's no shortage of ways to get people's attention. Uh, this one is the testimonial uh, or quotation. Uh, so here's, here's what that looks like. Uh, managers at many companies say transitioning to continuous reviews has dramatically improved performance and morale. I talked to three HR directors who started using continuous review systems in the past few years. Uh, Jana Lee, 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 <laughs> Jana Lee, uh, the HR director at Peakster Computing, told me that the company has increased billable hours in the consulting division by 35%. She attributes this to the coaching and motivating environment of continuous reviews. She said continuous reviews create an enjoyable culture of performance, quote unquote. I've seen a lot of speakers do this, and the person they'll be quoting will be sitting in the audience, right? And they'll make a reference to them, and they'll say, you know, Jenna, please stand up. <laughs> you know, sometimes they go to that uh, to that limit. So I always find that's a good way to get people's attention, too. Uh, you know, picking somebody out of the audience <laughs> can really get their attention in a hurry. <laughs> you know, maybe because you're kind of shit-turning the tables a little bit, right? And they know uh, people are looking over there and, and, and their direction, so people around Jenna... Uh, that might get their uh, their attention. Uh, that's not really the point here. Uh, you know, the point is just, again, putting a sort of a human face on this, showing how this is personally relevant. You know, this Peakster Computing, maybe that's a, maybe that's a firm uh, that this your company would recognize. You know, a lot of these uh, recently, I remember they were talking about the uh, my curriculum committee. Uh, they want to have a new uh, some new curriculum software. And their examples, they had a lot of testimonials in there from folks at Mankato. <laughs> and they were quoting people from Mankato that were really happy with the system that Mankato is using. Uh, so, again, you don't really have to think too hard about, well, you know, I'm probably I probably have a lot in common with that uh, professor over at Mankato. So maybe maybe, I should, maybe this is relevant to me. You know, we're not all that different. Uh, but that's that's sort of the idea behind this. Uh, short testimonials could be somebody they really respect. You know, think about how many advertisements are based on the uh, the testimony uh, of a somebody that's a uh, you know really competent athlete, for example. You, you probably want that person's shoes. <laughs> uh, okay. You know, and, and if you think about it, really, uh, Amazon.com, Jeff Bezos, he basically made his fortune on the basis of those testimonials. Uh, what what am I talking about? I'm talking about those. Uh, user reviews on the products, right? So I'm sure I'm not the only one I'm thinking about buying something. Now, I find myself, even if I'm in Walmart, I think, well, should I buy this or not? <laughs> even if I mean to buy it at Walmart, uh, I might still get on Amazon just so I can see some reviews, uh, what people have uh, said about it. Because that testimony of somebody that's more or less like me uh, goes a lot further uh, than some kind of marketing uh, you know, who cares if there's a billboard there <laughs> or a pamphlet or something? You know, I want to know. Uh, I want to. It's not relevant to me. It's not salient uh, unless it's somebody like myself uh, that prefers that product. Uh, okay, the intriguing statistic. Uh, now, notice the word intriguing. It's not just any statistic because there's a. You can be really boring with statistics. And I do mean you can bore people literally to death. I have died many times <laughs> listening to horribly dry statistics. It's not just any statistic, but if it's genuinely intriguing, if there's something uh, curious about it, it can uh, really work well. So here's a good example. So it's no secret that employees don't think annual reviews are accurate indicators of their performance. In fact, Roughly 50 to 75% of employees say this in various surveys. But did you know that nearly 50% of HR managers don't even think annual reviews are accurate? So you can see what they did here, right? The, the first bit, kind of common knowledge, uh, but then they, they sort of twist it and they show you like, but did you know? <laughs> and then they got this little bit of intrigue, uh, intriguing bit of this. Uh, so that works out really well. You know, it's, it's you know, it gets people to thinking more about it. Uh, you know, it gets people, uh, again, thinking about maybe this is something I should listen to. This does sound interesting. 
Uh, then we have the unexpected exercise. Oh boy, <laughs> this is my least favorite. <laughs> I hate this. Uh, nevertheless, I, I, it's been done to me many times. Uh, here's an example of what that looks like. As we get started, I'd like each of you to answer two questions with the person sitting next to you. Oh, I hate it already. <laughs> First, ask your partner, quote, what was the worst experience you've had getting a performance review? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, great. Uh, then ask, what was the best experience you've had getting a performance? What was the best experience you've had getting a performance review? Yeah, that's probably going to get them talking right away. <laughs> get them running for the door. <laughs> I don't know about this one. Uh, uh, but yeah, you know, this, this one, I, I don't know about this one. Uh, but I've certainly seen people do these kind of things before. Uh, I guess in a way you could even say the way I start these presentations off is kind of uh, an unexpected exercise. You know, go, go look at this fun little video. Uh, you probably don't expect to see a professor saying, hey, you know, watch this SNL clip. <laughs> it's a little bit unexpected, a little, a little bit of an icebreaker or whatever. It's a little bit out of the norm, a little bit unusual. Uh, you know, just something that can kind of get people to, you know, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> this exercise might get participants to open up and relax? Man, you gotta be kidding me. Man, I, I just, what the... Yeah, uh, that one does not... Uh, I don't think that would make people open up and relax. I think it would do the, the opposite. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I can think of other kinds of exercises. And, you know, some people go to... In other words, the language... When we were. Uh, doing the interviews for some of these uh, positions of uh, hiring new professors. I remember just about everyone would have some kind of activity. And uh, one of them was, uh, she had a poem she wanted us to analyze. I forget what was the, what was the poem? But anyway, she, she read a short poem and then she broke us up into uh, groups and had us uh, answer some questions about the poem. And that was uh, really unexpected. You know, I kind of just went there thinking I'd just kind of kick back, uh, <laughs> check my email. <laughs> maybe look at Facebook, you know, just, just kind of have my butt in the seat. Uh, but then she, uh, uh, she proved that me wrong. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly I had to do an unexpected exercise. <laughs> and so I don't know, did it, did it work? It certainly got my attention. Uh, I suppose it did kind of open us up a little bit, got us talking more. Uh, so I guess there is that, you know, again, I would, I like to think you could find an exercise that wouldn't be so traumatizing. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, I'm sure you can come up with something better than that. That's a horrible example. Uh, okay, types of effective attention gutters, seven of seven. All right, now we have the challenge. <laughs> That's fun already. <laughs> I think that last one was a bit of a challenge. All right, today, here's an example of a challenge. Uh, today I'm going to talk about transitioning from annual annual reviews to continuous reviews. I'm going to show you some new tools to provide feedback and coaching on a daily basis. When I once I explain these tools, I'm going ask, I'm going, I'm going to ask each of you to describe how you think this would impact your teams. So you notice what they're doing there. So it's almost like they're giving you some homework, kind of letting you know you better pay attention because uh, you know I'm going to be asking each of you to describe uh, this. <laughs> And so they talk about this in terms of a challenge. You know, I've heard a challenge used in different ways to the, uh, you know, literally like, like this is the challenge facing us. I want to challenge you all to uh, do X, Y, and Z. Uh, NPR during their pledge drives, they always like to start off their their spiel with a challenge. You know, they'll say, uh, you know, here's the challenge. We're trying to raise you know, this amount of money and. Uh, you know, my my God, if you just, if you just pick up the phone <laughs> within the next 10 seconds, <laughs> uh, the bomb won't go off. No, no, just kidding. Uh, they'll say if you call within the next few uh, hours or before the, so, such a time, uh, then this company or this other entity will kick in, you know, double your contribution, whatever. Uh, so everything's kind of geared around this idea of a challenge. And, and people like to feel like they're rising to the challenge, right? <laughs> they feel, oh, I did something today. <laughs> I rose to the occasion. <laughs> Uh, I get a bit facetious, a bit facetious, uh, but I think you get the idea, right? It, anything you can do, I guess the worst thing would be just everybody's asleep in the audience, nobody's paying attention. Uh, so any of these strategies, 
uh, if it serves to get their attention in a, in a good way <laughs> uh, that's the goal all right position statements uh, so we're moving on now from the uh, attention getter on to the position statement so this what is that it frames your message in appealing terms to your audience members and demonstrates the clear and valuable uh, benefits to them again coming back to this idea of how's this going to uh, benefit them and different kinds of audiences will find different things appealing right the uh, the teenagers versus your your parents generation versus your generation uh, they don't have they don't make the same commercial for all three of those <laughs> uh, demographics all right then the overview statement uh, so what is the whole what's sort of the big picture of your of your presentation uh, what's it all about uh, can you state that in one to three sentences in simple conversational language uh, sometimes you hear this referred to in a different context as a different context as an elevator pitch uh, or an elevator summary uh, but, you know the idea there is by the you know you get on the elevator with somebody uh, and this could happen you know let's just say you're at a conference and you want people to come to your comp your, your presentation <laughs> so you get you get on an elevator there's one other convention goer there uh, looking you know just as dorky as you <laughs> and they uh, they say what's your presentation about and you just get, like what's give me the overview uh, that happens so it's, it's good even even beyond just the presentation itself being able to say here's what it's about one to three sentences boom 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 uh, that's really good Yeah, and again, the idea of three key benefits or takeaway messages. So here's what it's about. Here's why you should come. Here's the three things you'll get out of this, hopefully. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of like with these uh, presentations, right? These are the five learning objectives. Here's what we want you to know. Uh, that zeros you in. Now, although I think that was more like five sentences. <laughs> anyway, uh, the majority of your presentation will be devoted to expressing and supporting your views, your two, three, or four uh, key messages and they emphasize here in the notes to this kind of interesting recognize that many of your audience members are skeptical after all you will likely be asking them to commit products <coughs> to your product services or ideas at the expense of their time money and, and other resources you know even with a you know, a lot of times the students kind of have to be there but it's, it's <laughs> not healthy to think about it that way you know, I think, uh, you know, I'm asking you to spend an hour with me. Uh, I need to try to make sure it's clear to you. Uh, this information will be beneficial. Uh, I take you seriously. I'm not just here to waste your time. Uh, I think that sort of respect uh, goes a long ways, uh, too. All right, here's the, the prep method. And I, I think this is really, really useful. I like this uh, a lot, actually. <laughs> this this prep method. I know this author is kind of crazy about the acronyms, but this one... Uh, this one in particular, I think, is good as a method. And it's from, let's see, executive communication coach Raleigh Grimshaw. Uh, so he says, the most serious mistake business managers make is to present the evidence first or present only the evidence and leave out their primary conclusions or central positions. Now, see, that's exactly what I noticed uh, happening in a lot of papers, to a lot of essays and uh, culminating projects uh, for the graduate students you know they, they do a great job collecting and presenting the evidence okay uh, that the problem though is that linkage you know linking uh, the evidence <laughs> first of all having a conclusion <laughs> you know, having some uh, takeaways right uh, but forging those links is uh, is the critical thing <laughs> so keep in mind this prep method I think you can find this uh, useful to you beyond uh, even beyond business uh, business writing but Anyway, what does it stand for? Uh, so stating your position, that's the P, uh, providing the, the reasons, that's the R, uh, giving an example or providing evidence, uh, that's the E, and then P, restating your position. So prep, position, reasons, example, position. Uh, so let's look at some examples here. Uh, so this would be a position statement. Quote, with annual reviews, our employees often get feedback when it's too late to make any changes. With continuous reviews from managers and peers, our employees will receive constant feedback, positive and negative, that will help them improve their performance right away. 
So you can see, <laughs> to me, that's a very effective position statement. It's clear. You know, I see what the, uh, you know, the benefit is. Let's see, what do they say here? The timing of the feedback. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I skipped on to the reasons. <laughs> anyway, that's the position statement. Step two, the reasons. Uh, many HR professionals in recent years have found that the timing of feedback, the amount of positive feedback, and feedback from a variety of colleagues all contribute to better performance. So you see they move from their position statement into their reasoning or rationale uh, for taking that position. And then we have our, the example or the evidence. So this is long. <laughs> I'll make it through this whole paragraph, we'll see. Now let me give you a quick example at Peekster Computing. Uh, Jana Lay, uh, the HR, see how many different ways I can pronounce <laughs> Lay, uh, the HR director estimated that productivity increased by 15 20% because of continuous reviews. After using continuous reviews for one year, comma, Jana conducted a complete evaluation, blah, 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 first, <laughs> blah, blah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm not going to read this whole paragraph to you, uh, but you can see basically this is the, you know, if this were an essay, you might be talking about the body paragraph. Uh, or the, you know, the key evidence, the examples, the support. Well, that example goes on. <laughs> That's basically an essay. Let's just look at the last part of it. Now, uh, compare that to an annual review from a single manager's viewpoint where an employee might get three to four suggestions. Uh, so that's all step three, the example part of prep. And then lastly, the position. So remember, this one is just uh, to review, basically. Uh, restate the position. Uh, so we anticipate the same results here at Eastman. Continuous reviews will ensure each employee gets more constructive feedback more often. We expect the self feedback will increase the performance level of our employees. So I don't know about you. I think this is clear prep. <laughs> you know, it works well. Uh, I encourage you to use that. You know, don't just jump right into the examples, remember? Uh, everything needs to be linked. <laughs> okay, I don't want to beat that uh, horse too <laughs> yet again. <laughs> All right, concluding with an effective review. Uh, so this, remember that last little bit, it's only about 5%. Uh, so it's a small percentage of your presentation time. However, make sure to have a strong finish. And this is the place where you're hoping to gain buy-in on uh, specific actions. <laughs> okay, step number one, <laughs> make sure to have a strong finish. Now, I mean, it's a little bit silly just to say that, you know. Uh, yeah, just, by the way, make sure to have a good presentation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for that tip. Uh, but yeah, the idea is just in terms of being a human. You know, think about running a marathon or a race, <laughs> working out on the cross trainer. <laughs> you know, I tend to do this myself. Huh? You know, you're working really hard, uh, you're running really hard, whatever. And then you see, well, I got five minutes left on the clock. And then suddenly you're just like, you're, you're, it's like you're almost already cooling down. Uh, when, you know, you talk to your, the coaches and they'll say, no, don't don't slow down when you see the finish line, right? Uh, you know, fight that impulse. Uh, you know, picture yourself beyond the finish line. <laughs> you know, don't focus on the finish line. Focus on that beyond point and make sure that you hit it, you know, at full speed instead of, uh, you know, slowing down. So it's a lot like that with the presentation. You know, as you'll notice as you get closer to the end of your presentation, kind of like just the same deal with that race. Uh, you might start getting, uh, you know, you probably are a little tired, you know, it's, it's, especially if it's a long presentation like this one. <laughs> but you just have to remember, you know, you want really, you really want to stay strong with this. You want to end on a high note, is the way I like to put that. Uh, yeah, maybe come back to some of those attention getters again, even. You know, just some way you can you can end this <laughs> on a bang. Uh, instead of a whimper. And let's see, recapping your message again, just a few sentences. Yeah, always a, a good idea. Yeah, and then the call to action. Like, what do you want people to do? Do you want them to call a number? Uh, do you want them to vote for you on such such a date? Uh, do you want them, uh, uh, you know, to, to bring you in for an interview? Do you want them to buy your software? <laughs> uh, do you want them to buy this car? Uh, you basically want to close the deal. All right, and here's the uh, the part we kind of open with. 
uh, the appealing slides <laughs> avoid death by PowerPoint so we just hopefully you watched that video you saw the death by PowerPoint video <laughs> uh, you know I love that stuff uh, it's easy to make fun of people uh, now but keep in mind you might be doing some of the same stuff and not even realizing it uh, so you really want to be careful there you know have you overloaded it have you gotten yourself carried away uh, with the fonts with the animations is there too much text on that slide yeah this is a good point too you are the focus of your presentation that is a the PowerPoint is just there as a visual aid it's not a, a substitute for you All right so there's nothing wrong uh, you can hit B the letter B on your uh, PowerPoints or you can if you're giving this if it, a lot of people have a remote control these days and they just blank you know mute the presentation for a little while if it's not important you know whatever's up there's not important you just show a blank screen for a while get the attention back on you uh, you know that's preferable a lot of people like to hide though you know this is something well I'm sure we'll talk about this next time but you know let's just say that's the old uh, lectern there the podium and then it's almost like they're trying to hide behind that podium and they just want to keep you reading stuff up here all the time keep all the attention on that screen uh, instead of on the human being you know that's a mistake again you're, you're paying this is what you want to see you want the human <laughs> you can read this at home right uh, the reason you're there you're engaged uh, whether or not you're engaged I should say it has to do with that human connection that strong emotional connection and it's not going to be there if uh, you're not the focus if you're making the slides the focus now creating a storyboard uh, with your PowerPoint slide title so we talked about that idea it is kind of like a story even with characters you know if you're writing a, a scary story you'd want to have some characters in there <laughs> uh, same thing with the you know the presentation like those testimonials you think about testimonial uh, is really kind of a character it's like a way to put a little character into a story and make it make it dramatic you know that's going to be appealing uh, than just some kind of dry uh, statistics or facts that don't seem to have any uh, salience uh, or relevance on a personal connection let's see avoiding death by powerpoint <laughs> this is a, that's a quotation <laughs> okay wow there's got to be is it you know what is this what they call irony <laughs> all right uh, i actively despise how people use powerpoint as a crutch I think PowerPoint can be a way to cover up sloppy thinking, which makes it hard to differentiate between good ideas and bad ideas. I'd rather have somebody write something longhand, send it in ahead of the meeting, and then assume everyone's read it. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> uh, have we added value? Yes or no? And I would say that if a meeting is mostly the presentation of a deck of PowerPoint slides, you convey an information, but you didn't actually add the value. Well, that's a fair point you know that is a fair point uh, what is my value uh, hopefully I like to think my value is providing some energy <laughs> to these topics providing some personal examples uh, some stories trying to keep things uh, humorous uh, but at the same time emphasizing the important points you know I, I, th I like to think I add value but on the other hand I, if I just said look here's the slides go read the slides yeah the content would be there but would it really be would I really have added value at that point not really you could have found this on your own right well, let's see death by PowerPoint two of three oh, there's a bunch of quotes <laughs> what is going on here with this PowerPoint and so what is this the director at PepsiCo let's see I prefer people not go through a slide deck if you're working in an area and you're running a business you ought to be able to stand up there and tell me about your business without referring to a big slide deck <laughs> you are speaking people should focus on you and focus on the message they can't walk away remembering a whole bunch of different things so you have to have three or four key messages okay <laughs> this is kind of depressing man so avoiding death by power maybe i haven't avoided maybe i've been killed by powerpoint uh, death by powerpoint occurs because of the bullet trap uh, speakers and presenters often reduce their presentations to a series of bullets and thoughts in outline form as a result they often bore their audience and lose connection i like the way the comedian put it better uh, what was the, he said about the bullets uh, i don't remember off the top of my head it's funny though all right setting up slide titles to help you make a smooth logical presentation that's what they're talking about the storylining 
And, uh, you know, next time you're using PowerPoint, uh, look over there. And there is a way, usually PowerPoint will try to automatically title the slides for you. Over on the left, there'll be an outline view uh, showing you the each slide and the title. And by default, it just puts in, I think, whatever you put on the slide. But you can improve upon that. It might actually be better, instead of doing it that way, to make your outline first. Uh, so just come up with some titles for some slides. And you may or may not show that on the slide itself. Uh, you might just put it on your outline. Uh, again, here on the, it'd be on the left-hand side usually. And this will just help you provide some structure <coughs> and be thinking ahead. It also makes it easier to evaluate it later on. You can just flip through it quick and make sure, well, did I talk about the problems there? <laughs> no, I got off task. <laughs> I showed a picture of a cat there. Uh, okay, delete, delete the cat. Uh, let's think, problems with annual reviews. And let's look at the story. <clears throat> so positive overarching theme in the title slide, attention getter, and then they go into the needs, and then the solution. So really good structure. Uh, now you could come up with a title first, you come up with a storyline first. Uh, you might just start off with those numbers. Uh, but instead of just jumping right into putting in the details on the content, I think about the structure, the big picture first. And, you know, how many slides are you going to have? You know, maybe go ahead and create 10 slides and then start giving them uh, titles or storylines, you know, just notes, uh, you know, think about it that way and then work backwards. Or I guess you could say work forwards. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but that might help. I notice a lot of people kind of use PowerPoint just to brainstorm. Uh, so they'll just make a new slide, just start putting in whatever pops into their head and go on to the next slide. And there, there's very little systematic thinking there. It's great for brainstorming, but really what they need to do after that is just put that brainstorming aside and, and use it uh, to build a really structured presentation uh, with a little bit more logic <laughs> to the flow. Uh, so again, I'm not going to read all these uh, slide titles to you, but you can see each one has a point. Uh, it all fits in uh, to their structure, makes sense. Uh, designing slides for ease of processing, uh, limiting the amount of information, uh, use font sizes that all audience members can read easily, <laughs> that's your personality. <laughs> I guess I should, well, I, I guess I should use Comic Sans, right? Uh, focus, focus on and highlight the key information and use plenty of white space, right? So sometimes people are, you know, they'll think, how can I really emphasize a point, right? And they got the highlighter going and the you know, they're really doing everything. They got this little bullet point there bigger than the other ones. And they're doing all this stuff to make it really draw a lot of attention. And then I say, why don't you just uh, put use plenty of white space? Just put that point on a, a, a slide by itself. That's literally the only text there. Uh, that's the use of white space to draw emphasis. You don't need to bold it, underline it, make it bigger. <laughs> you know, it's the fact that there's nothing ar around it. You've removed the distractions. Uh, so that's what'll draw the emphasis. That, that's what'll make it easier to process. <coughs> uh, excuse me. All right, a couple more. Uh, well, I guess uh, four more tips for designing these slides for ease of uh, processing using the high contrast uh, background. Oh, crap, <laughs> backgrounds and colors. Uh, by the way, don't draw lines through uh, what you want people to read. So high contrast backgrounds and colors. So you notice black text on a white background. It's there's a reason books are like that. <laughs> it's easy to read. And if I had a, a very light gray text, it would be hard to read. And that's how they flip it around up here. You got the white text, uh, but they have this, I don't know how to describe this sort of pattern, blue gradient. Uh, so it's easy enough to see. Uh, use compelling images in moderation. Uh, so don't overdo it with the uh, the clip art. And if you do have a photo, I think if you're going to bother with an image, you know, make it something, make it a good image. You know, find something that's really striking. You know, a good quality photo, for example. A really sharp uh, chart or diagram. You know, that's much better uh, than, again, you know, if you have like one really good looking chart, <laughs> uh, that's better than to have 50 of them in there that look uh, sloppy and are confusing. Uh, get professional design help when possible. And yes, this can make a, a huge difference. If you've never worked with a designer before, it's just really kind of amazing. Uh, I think uh, people tend to think of, well, it's the graphic design. That's art. 
you know, I don't, I don't need to know anything about that. Or <laughs> they, they just, they're there just to make things look fancy, look nice. And, you know, people tend to be just kind of, uh, almost elitist about it sometimes, I, I think. You know, well, the content's what's important. Uh, well, that for me, the design is part of the content. Uh, and if you work with somebody who really knows what they're doing, uh, you know, they can make that uh, PowerPoint more effective and not just uh, amplifying what, what it is you're saying, but, you know, they, they have their own contributions uh, to the process. So I think it's a good idea uh, for everybody to learn some design. And we do have classes. We have a class that uh, Judy Kilborn uh, teaches or <laughs> used to teach document design. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, about using these, uh, uh, what is it, Adobe, I'm blanking on the name, InDesign. <laughs> Here we go, yeah. Uh, yeah, just being kind of familiar with that software, even if you're not really super talented. I don't I don't really believe in talent myself. But, uh, but even if you're just semi-familiar familiar, familiar with how it works and what it has to offer, uh, that would make it better uh, if you do have the opportunity to work with somebody uh, professionally. Uh, all right, Prezi presentation tips. Uh, <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Oh, we're talking about Prezi. Oh, yes, my uh, arch nemesis. Uh, <laughs> I don't ever use Prezi. <laughs> I just can't stand Prezi. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride of nausea. <laughs> if you've never used it, you know, I guess you can use it well. Uh, they say instead of like PowerPoint's based on this card deck metaphor, that's based on a spatial metaphor. So you like know, just zoom in around. Uh, <laughs> there's the slide one. And whoa there's slide <laughs> okay I'd be a little silly there but uh, it is you know you can depending on what the presentation is about it can make a lot of sense to use Prezi especially if it is something spatial you know like if I had a presentation about a, oh I don't know the the heart you know you could base this is that a <laughs> is that a heart I don't know <laughs> uh, but you could have it set up so like maybe we'll talk about this part of the heart over here first uh, so you could tell Presley basically to zoom in there and show him that and then move over to the left, uh, to the right and talk about that piece over there. Uh, so you can make it very spatially. Is that a, I don't know what I'm trying to say there. <laughs> but you, yeah, use the mo you can use the motion uh, effectively uh, by moving all around uh, that image. Uh, you know, that can work pretty well. You could do the same thing with an infographic. You know, imagine you had this giant infographic. Uh, you couldn't put that all on the screen. It would drive people insane. You literally would kill them. <laughs> but kill them by Prezi. <laughs> uh, you could show that at the begin beginning of a Prezi, though, and then, you know, have it set so the first piece zooms in on that part, and then you could either go down the side or, you know, however you wanted to arrange it. That's what's pretty cool with Prezi. Or you could have, you know, you could have it zooming in the whole time, you know, on various uh, levels. <laughs> Just however you wanted to do it, but you have to think in terms of, uh, you know, moving around a space instead of just flipping through a, a deck of cards. Integrating video, pictures, graphics, yes. And make sure the key messages are the emphasis. Yeah, this is an important point because a lot of people, you know, if they're, they're using Prezi and they get really uh, turned on by the roller coaster, what I call just this, this movement, uh, they got stuff spinning upside down, they got they just kind of go nuts with it, and that gets to be the emphasis at that point. It's not really about the – they come away from message and they get to – they're having too much fun, basically. <laughs> uh, keep it simple. All right, the storyline. So remember we said make the presentation like a story if at all possible, simply because, yeah, people do remember the stories more easily than they do the abstract information. They're more likely to act on what they hear via stories. And so I'll give an example again. I was just reviewing a, an article for a journal, and the uh, it was about uh, students with uh, disabilities and what writing instructors can do uh, to accommodate those students. And the focus was kind of on uh, how the writing instructors can work with their uh, disabilities uh, office on campus and some of the, you know, it's kind of informational, you know, just what is <laughs> what kind of services are available. Uh, but it was very kind of dry reading. It didn't really uh, connect on an emotional level. It connected intellectually, but, you know, there really wasn't, you know, I was reading this and I really didn't get a good sense of, like, why this is important or, or why should I care about this. Uh, so me or the other reviewer and I both made the point 
maybe put in an anecdote there. You know, a little story. You know, tell us, you know, paint a little picture of a student maybe with a disability and some of the uh, challenges, uh, you know, they're facing or maybe tell it the, from the teacher's point of view. You know, we just kind of put a character in there, basically. You know, tell a little story, have a little drama, <laughs> and that's going to lead to a lot more emotional engagement because we can see that student, we can see that teacher, and we can really engage with that. We can see the, you know, that's a teacher just like me. Uh, that, that's why this is relevant to me. Oh, look, there's the student. Uh, you know, you could uh, certainly engage better that way uh, than just with a bunch of really dry uh I mean, it wasn't really, it wasn't that dry, <laughs> uh, but you know what I'm saying. It kind of lacked that, uh, what I call a human interest touch or human interest angle. <clears throat> All right, stories for businesses uh, generally contain the uh, following elements. Plot, uh, so just like a, a short story or novel would have a setting, uh, the resolution and the moral uh, or the lesson. So a lot of people say that business writing and professional communication, there's, there's no relationship at all between this and creative writing. And you can tell them that's actually not true. <laughs> uh, that matter of fact, that's uh, completely the opposite. Uh, that you, you know, that the, the textbook itself says that you need to use stories and use the same type of uh, creativity uh, that goes into a good short story. Uh, the same stuff is there in a good business presentation. All right, are the presentations fair? Uh, is it factual? Have you presented all the facts? You know, obviously you might not be able to put every fact from the whole paper in there, uh, but you certainly want the ones that are relevant. Uh, access, so again, things about motive. I think, is this the same uh, slide we've seen before? I don't, I'm not sure that this is uh, specific to these uh, PowerPoints, but uh, yeah, all this stuff obviously would apply. You know, why are you giving this presentation? Uh, are you interested or <laughs> who sponsored the study? You know, all that kind of stuff might be focused on there. Uh, what, how will it impact people? Are you being honest about that? Remember when I was a kid, every magazine I opened, there would be a or comic book even would have a, a page there that would say, get 10, uh, 10 tapes, 10 cassette tapes <laughs> for a penny <laughs> or 10 uh, CDs for a penny. Uh, and they didn't really talk about the impact of that. Uh, I don't think that was really mentioned. You really had to get into the fine print to figure out that you were just obligating yourself to a world of woe. <laughs> and it's going to be hard to cancel uh, once you got into that. Uh, respect. How respectful is the presentation? Does it offend or pressure? That's a, you know, that's a big thing. Would a neutral observer consider your communication respectful? That, you know, I really always like this last point there. Because so, sometimes you don't know, right? You're looking at it, you think, I don't know, is this okay? Uh, could this be offensive? I don't find it offensive. But, you know, you're not always the best judge yourself. You know, especially if you are the type of person that has gotten into, uh, you know, <laughs> trouble before. <laughs> or people tell you, 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 don't, you don't have a very good filter. Uh, you know, if you've heard anything like that, uh, then just, you know, have a friend take a look at it, your parent, you know, anybody. And say, hey, we take a minute, look at this slide. Is this okay? <laughs> Is this okay for a business presentation? And, you know, be honest. And if they tell you, uh, no, you should take it out, I just go ahead and take it out. <laughs> Err on the side of being uh, uh, boring uh, rather than risk uh, offense. Uh, again, we're not stand up comics here. All right, chapter takeaways. This is our review. Planning presentations leads to credibility. Uh, principles of audience analysis, the message benefits. <laughs> we did talk about those learning styles, although, uh, again, I'm kind of a little questionable about that. Uh, communicator styles, the structure, the preview, the view, and the review. The slide presentations, avoiding PowerPoint death or death by PowerPoint. Uh, how you might use a story or sort of anecdotal approach. Uh, you know, walk people through a scenario, uh, bring in your data. Uh, as it's necessary to tell that story. Uh, people will be able to hold on to that better, be a lot more memorable, uh, again, than if you don't have a, any sort of sense of setting or narrative or moral. Uh, and then making it fair, using that same rubric uh, we've talked about before. All right. <laughs> that will do it. <laughs> uh, finish strong. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, that was enjoyable.
Uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, you know, I want to hear about some PowerPoints or Prezi's if you've worked with that. You know, tell me about a time you used that. You know, what went well, what didn't go well. Do you, do you have funny stories? <laughs> I always I like to read those. Uh, or just general comments or, or whatever it is. You know, I like to read it. Uh, so, again, hope you enjoyed that and see you next time.